Chapter Nineteen, Part One of An Antarctic Mystery, or The Sphinx of the Ice Fields. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Antarctic Mystery by Jules Verne. Chapter Nineteen, Part One. Land. Land is the only word to be found at the beginning of the nineteenth chapter of Edgar Poe's book. I thought it would be a good idea, placing after it a note of interrogation, to put it as a heading to this portion of our narrative. Did that word, dropped from our foremast head, indicate an island or a continent? And, whether a continent or an island, did not a disappointment await us? Could they be there, whom we had come to seek? And Arthur Pym, who was dead, unquestionably dead, in spite of Dirk Peters' assertions, had he ever set foot on this land? When the welcome word resounded on board the Jane on the 17th January, 1828, a day full of incidents according to Arthur Pym's diary, it was succeeded by land on the starboard bow. Such might have been the signal from the masthead of the Halbrane. The outline of land, lightly drawn above the skyline, were visible on this side. The land announced to the sailors of the Jane was the wild and barren Bennet Islet. Less than one degree south of it lay Salal Island, then fertile, habitable, and inhabited, and on which Captain Len Guy had hoped to meet his fellow countrymen. But what would this unknown island, five degrees further off, in the depths of the southern sea, be for our schooner? Was it the goal so ardently desired, and so earnestly sought for? Were the two brothers, William and Len Guy, to meet at this place? Would the Halbrane come there to the end of a voyage? whose success would be definitely secured by the restoration of the survivors of the Jane to their country? I repeat that I was just like the half-breed. Our aim was not merely to discover the survivors, nor was success in this matter the only success we looked for. However, since land was before our eyes, we must get nearer to it first. That cry of land caused an immediate diversion of our thoughts. I no longer dwelt upon the secret Dirk Peters had just told me and perhaps the half-breed forgot it also, for he rushed to the bow and fixed his eyes immovably on the horizon. As for West, whom nothing could divert from his duty, he repeated his commands. Gratien came to take the helm, and Hearn was shut up in the hold. On the whole this was a just punishment, and none of the old crew protested against it, for Hearn's inattention awkwardness had really endangered the schooner for a short time only. Five or six of the Falkland sailors did, however, murmur a little. A sign from the mate silenced them, and they returned at once to their posts. Needless to say, Captain Len Guy, upon hearing the cry of the lookout man, had tumbled up from his cabin, and eagerly examined this land at ten or twelve miles' distance. As I have said, I was no longer thinking about the secret Dirk Peters had confided to me. Besides, so long as the secret remained between us two, and neither would betray it, there was nothing to fear. But if ever an unlucky accident were to reveal to Martin Holt that his brother's name had been changed to Parker, that the unfortunate man had not perished in the shipwreck of the Grampus, but had been sacrificed to save his companions from perishing hunger, that Dirk Peters, to whom Martin Holt himself owed his life, had killed him with his own hand, what might not happen then? This was the reason why the half-breed shrank from any expression of thanks from Martin Holt, why he avoided Martin Holt, the victim's brother. The boatswain had just struck six bells. The schooner was sailing with the caution, demanded by navigation in unknown seas. There might be shoals or reefs barely hidden under the surface, on which she might run aground or be wrecked. As things stood with the halbrane, and even admitting that she could be floated again, an accident would have rendered her return impossible before the winter set in. We had urgent need that every chance should be in our favour, and not one against us. West had given orders to shorten sail. When the boatswain had furled the top-gallant sail, the top-sail, and the royal, the halbrane remained under her mainsail, her foresail, and her jib sufficient canvas to cover the distance that separated her from land in a few hours. Captain Len Guy immediately heaved the lead, which showed a depth of twenty fathoms. Several other soundings showed that the coast, which was very steep, was probably prolonged like a wall under the water. 
Nevertheless, as the bottom might happen to rise sharply instead of following the slope of the coast, we did not venture to proceed out of the sounding line in hand. The weather was still beautiful, although the sky was overcast by a mist from the southeast to southwest. Owing to this, there was some difficulty in identifying the vague outlines which stood out like a floating vapor in the sky, disappearing and then reappearing between the breaks of the mist. However, we all agreed to regard this land as from twenty-five to thirty fathoms in height, at least at its highest part. No, we would not admit that we were the victims of a dilution, and yet our uneasy minds feared that it might be so. Is it not natural, after all, for the heart to be assailed by a thousand apprehensions as we near the end of any enterprise? At this thought my mind became confused and dreamy. The halbrane seemed to be reduced to the dimensions of a small boat, lost in this boundless space, the contrary of that limitless sea of which Edgar Poe speaks, where, like a living body, the ship grows larger. When we have charts or even sailing directions instruct us concerning the hydrography of the coasts, the nature of the landfalls, the bays and the creeks, we may sail along boldly. In every other region the master of the ship must not defer the order to cast anchor near the shore until the morrow. But where we were, what an amount of prudence was necessary, and yet no manifest obstacle was before us. Moreover, we had no cause to fear that the light would fail us during the sunny night. At this season the sun did not set so soon under the western horizon, and its rays bathed the vast Antarctic zone in unabated light. From that day forward the ship's log recorded that the temperature fell continuously. The thermometer in the air and in the shade did not mark more than thirty-two degrees, zero degrees Fahrenheit, and when plunged into the water it only indicated twenty-six degrees, three point three three degrees Celsius below zero. What could be the cause of this fall, since we were at the height of the southern summer? The crew were obliged to resume their woolen clothing, which they had left off a month previously. The schooner, however, was sailing before the wind, and these first cold blasts were less keenly felt. Yet we recognized the necessity of reaching our goal as soon as possible. To linger in this region, or to expose ourselves to the danger of wintering out, would be to tempt Providence. Captain Len Guy tested the direction of the currents by heavy lead lines, and discovered that it was beginning to deviate from its former course. "'Whether it is a continent,' he said, "'that lies before us, or whether it is an island, we have at present no means of determining. If it be a continent, we must conclude that the current has an issue towards the southeast.' "'And it is quite possible,' I replied, "'that the solid part of the Antarctic region may be reduced to a mere polar mound. In any case, it is well to note any of those observations which are likely to be accurate. That is what I am doing, Mr. Jorling, and we shall bring back a mass of information about this portion of the southern sea, which will prove useful to navigators. If ever any venture to come so far south, Captain, we have penetrated so far, thanks to the help of particular circumstances, the earliness of the summer season, an abnormal temperature, and a rapid thaw. Such conditions may only occur once in twenty or fifty years. Wherefore, Mr. Jorling, I thank Providence for this, and hope revives in me to some extent. As the weather has been constantly fine, what is there to make it impossible for my brother and my fellow countrymen to have landed on this coast, whither the wind and the tide bore them? What our schooner has done, their boat may have done. They surely did not start on a voyage which might be prolonged to an indefinite time without a proper supply of provisions. Why should they not have found the resources as those afforded to them by the island of Salal during many long years? They had ammunition and arms elsewhere. Fish abound in these waters, waterfowl also. Oh, yes, my heart is full of hope, and I wish I were a few hours older." Without being quite so sanguine as Langai, I was glad to see he had regained his hopeful mood. Perhaps his investigations were successful. I might be able to have them continued in Arthur Pym's interest, even into the heart of this strange land which we were approaching. The Halbrane was going along slowly on these clear waters, which swarmed with fish, 
belonging to the same species as we had already met. The seabirds were more numerous, and were evidently not frightened, for they kept flying around the mast, or perching in the yards. Several whitish ropes, about five or six feet long, were brought on board. They were chaplets formed of millions of shellfish. Whales, spouting jets of feathery water from their blowholes, appeared at a distance, and I remarked that all of them took a southerly direction. There was therefore reason to believe that the sea extended far and wide in that direction. The schooner covered two or three miles of her course without any increase of speed. This coast, evidently, stretched from northwest to southeast. Nevertheless, the telescopes revealed no distinctive features, even after three hours' navigation. The crew, gathered together on the forecastle, were looking on without revealing their impressions. West, after going aloft to the four cross trees, where he had remained ten minutes, had reported nothing precise. Stationed at the port side, leaning my elbows on the bulwarks, I closely watched the skyline, broken only towards the east. At this moment the boatswain rejoined me, and without preface said, "'Will you allow me to give you my opinion, Mr. Jorling?' "'Give it, boatswain,' I replied, at the risk of my not adopting it, if I don't agree with it. "'It is correct, and according as we get nearer, one must really be blind not to adopt it. "'And what idea have you got?' "'That this is not land which lies before us, Mr. Jorling.' "'What is it you are saying?' "'Look attentively, putting one finger before your eyes. "'Look there, out at starboard.' "'I did as Hurley-Gurley directed. "'Do you see?' he began again. May I lose my liking for my grog, if these heights do not change place, not with regard to the schooner, but with regard to themselves. And what do you conclude from this? That they are moving icebergs. Icebergs? Sure enough, Mr. Jorling. Was not the boatswain mistaken? Were we in for a disappointment? Were there only drifting ice mountains in the distance, instead of ashore? Presently there was no doubt on the subject. For some time past the crew had no longer believed the existence of land in that direction. Ten minutes afterwards the man in the crow's nest announced that several icebergs were coming northwest, in an oblique direction, into the course of the Halbrane. This news produced great sensation on board. Our last hope was suddenly extinguished, and what a blow to Captain Len Guy! We should have to seek land of the austral zone under higher latitudes, without being sure of ever coming across it. And then the cry, "'Back ship! Back ship!' sounded almost unanimously on board the Halbrane. Yes, indeed, the recruits from the Falklands demanding that we should turn back, although Hearn was not there to fan the flame of insubordination, and I must acknowledge that the greater part of the old tars seemed to agree with them. West awaited his chief's orders, not daring to impose silence. Gretchen was at the helm, ready to give a turn to the wheel, whilst his comrades, with their hands on the cleats, were preparing to ease off the sheets. Dirk Peters remained immovable, leaning against the foremast, his head down, his body bent, and his mouth set firm. Not a word passed his lips. But now he turned towards me, and what a look of mingled wrath and entreaty he gave me! I don't know what irresistible motive induced me to interfere personally, and once again to protest. A final argument had just crossed my mind, an argument whose weight could not be disputed. So I began to speak, and I did so with such conviction that none tried to interrupt me. The substance of what I said was as follows. No, all hope must not be abandoned. Land cannot be far off. The icebergs which formed in the open sea by the accumulation of ice are not before us. These icebergs must have broken off from the solid base of a continent or an island. Now, since the thaw begins at this season of the year, the drift will only last a short time. Behind them we must meet the coast on which they were formed. In another twenty-four hours, or forty-eight at the most, if the land does not appear, Captain Len Guy will steer to the north again. Had I convinced the crew— or ought I to take advantage of Hearn's absence, and of the fact that he could not communicate with them, to make them understand that they were being deceived, and to repeat to them that it would endanger the schooner if our course were now to be reversed? The boatswain came to my help, 
and in a good-humoured voice exclaimed, "'Very well reasoned, and for my part I accept Mr. Jorling's opinion. Assuredly, land is near. If we seek it beyond those icebergs, we shall discover it without much hard work or great danger. What is one degree further south, when it is a question of putting a hundred additional dollars into one's pocket? And let us not forget that if they are acceptable when they go in, they are none the less so when they come out. Upon this, Endicott the cook came to the aid of his friend the boatswain. Yes, very good things indeed are dollars, he cried, showing two rows of shining white teeth. Did the crew intend to yield to Hurley-Gurley's argument, or would they try to resist if the Halbrane went on in the direction of the icebergs? Captain Len Guy took up his telescope again, and turned it upon these moving masses. He observed them with much attention, and cried out in a loud voice, "'Steer south-south-west!' West gave the orders to execute the manoeuvres. The sailor hesitated an instant, then recalled to obedience. They began to brace the yards, and slap the sheets, and the schooner increased her speed. When the operation was over, I went up to Hurley-Gurley, and drawing him aside, I said, "'Thank you, Boson. "'Ah, Mr. Jorling,' he replied, shaking his head, "'it is all very fine for this time, but you must not do it again. "'Every one would turn against me, even Endicott, perhaps. "'I have urged nothing, which is not at least probable,' I answered sharply. "'I don't deny that fact, Mr. Jorling.' "'Yes, Hurley-Gurley, yes, I believe what I have said, and I have no doubt.' but that we shall really see land beyond the icebergs. Just possible, Mr. Jorling, quite possible. But it must appear before two days, or on the word of a boatswain, nothing can prevent us from putting about. End of chapter 19, part 1